so you talk about the the foot to the core connection right mm -hmm. uh, there's definitely medical evidence of that right can you talk about that a little bit uh more yeah so there's three ways in how you could tie in the foot to the core one is from fascial lines so anatomy trains fascial lines um kind of the interconnected uh, fascial systems within the body. The second is through co-contractions that happen in the body, which just means that, oh, when you engage your quads, your TVA contracts higher. There's a lot of research around that. And then third would be what's called muscle synergies. And those are pre-programmed uh, neuro sequences that essentially just trigger another activation somewhere else in the body. So those are actually called muscle synergies, which is a little bit different than a co-contraction. So from the fascial perspective, which is uh, one of my favorite ways to look at it, is fascial connections are fast, is how I try to teach uh, coaches and professionals to think about it. So if you have fascial lines or fascial uh, integration, it's like a you know, there's something going through like a telephone wire, like it's, it's there, right? It's faster yes. than your eyes can even like kind of comprehend it. So you have the deep front fascia line, which connects your long flexors through your posterior tibialis into your adductors, into your obturator fascia, which is part of the deep hip, into the pelvic floor, into the diaphragm, your psoas comes down and then it continues up through your neck and it goes up to where the tongue is. So that's the deep front fascial line, which is where if anyone does the work you do, the work that I do, or how Dr. Yanda explains it, and they do, we'll just call it short foot, short foot, and they say, I feel it in my adductors, like, is that normal? Should I be feeling it in my inner thigh? That makes sense because there's fascial connections between these different muscles. Now, just because something is fascially connected doesn't mean it's optimized, <laughs> which is where I try to bring a conscious awareness to these connections so that you can um, kind of rewire them or hack them to be a little bit more efficient, which is the conscious toes down, exhale, pelvic floor up. And I, that's why I build it into my programming. Um, and then you do it enough. Now, every time I push my toes down, my levator A9 lifts. So it's just something that's programmed into my body. The second one is the co-contraction. So the co-contraction that is built into the lower extremity is tied around really ambulation. And the other key thing that I look at when I, I look at human function and human performance and fascia is the evolution of bipedalism. So mm -hmm. I try to go back to the foundation of foot positions that are required for us to walk, movements of the pelvis that are required for us to walk. So what happens when we walk is you need your foot to get into the lever, which I said, which means you need the bottom of the foot, the posterior group to contract. So you get bottom of the foot intrinsics, calves contracting, quads contracting. When you contract your quads, you get higher TVA. So you start to get that co-contraction that is built into um, like a push off position, right? That if you were trying, like okay. you're pushing out of the blocks, your toes would go down, your intrinsics would contract, obviously Be you're like extending this, your knee. Right? Exactly, yep. Mm -hmm. So you want, obviously, those are all the power groups, right? And then the other ones are kind of like the decelerators or the controllers of the movement. Um, so co-contraction around power muscles. And then the third, the synergistic one, um, I can show you the, or send you the research study for it. Yeah, it yeah, was, no problem. A, a research study around a muscle synergy that exists in the brain. So within the central nervous system, they saw that when the part of the motor cortex that's associated with the hallux, the big toe, when that was lit up, there was a synergy in the posterior pelvic floor, which mm -hmm. to me is super cool. Like I was just like, that is coolest shit that just locks in what I've been teaching for years in right. another way. Yeah, I, that's say, what type of research I want to uh, have, yeah. you know? <laughs> yeah, exactly. I wish yeah. it with you. Where you're like, well, why, why would that happen? Mm -hmm. 
and it's it's essentially going back to walking and that when you're walking and you're about to push off and you're in that lever oh when your toe pushes down so you can take a step you also need pelvic stability because that's your center of gravity right so to me it, it totally makes sense and then what it also locked in is that if you stimulate the hallux down pelvic floor engages but the reverse doesn't happen of course it makes sense right when you engage your pelvic floor it's not like your foot's going to contract yeah. but to understand that the driver is the ground it's is the foot huge to sports like what you're doing it's the ground it's the foot it's that relationship and then harness it through the rest of the body you know this is this is very uh similar to what what tai chi the the silk reeling uh movement is talk, describing it's basically one part moves all part moves mm -hmm. And, and and in my line of work what i'm trying to tell people is that okay when you have full degeneration when when you when your neurologically is not on a, a high level your what happens is that your your for example your foot don't have the necessary fascia connection to the to the glutes to your abs so what what we're, what we're trying to build is the fascia connection first is to from the uh, hamstring to the glutes first mm -hmm. and that's what in my system is the we call it the level three so once you have that your once your glutes can respond to your foot uh, and has generate high level of EMG readings then you reach that level but then that doesn't stop there like people think like oh you're talking about a imaginary connection to the to the abs that's not true because they're evidence that the the abs through fascia connection are connected holistically to the foot so this is where our system of training is level four comes from is when your uh, fascia connection is responsive enough it reaches your your abs so now when your abs when you brace your abs you can actually see signals of emg reading of your glutes when these all connect that's level four in yeah. our training so uh, you know our training so i'm just trying to share like what we saw in terms of uh people doing this type of training and what we can measure but i think a lot of people don't understand is you know uh they they see these uh elite athletes a lot of division one athletes uh, and and all these amazing athletes do things on, on on tv they don't understand but there is a a a, a definitive difference in how they use their feet and what fascia connections they have so today i mean in today's uh, training uh we see okay so this guy is more fit than the other guy by just looking at the size of their biceps or the size of their chest they say okay this guy is more fit but there is also a invisible fascia fitness level that you can't really see but you can measure it through emg which is the connect fascia connection from your feet to the glutes, your to the from the glutes to the abs and to your holistic body. So now, when when if you actually want to have a fully responsive tensegrity model of the body moving in unison and generating a lot of power, you have to have this connection. But this is something that's basically blocked by our sensory work in our eye. We cannot see. But doesn't mean it does not exist. And I'm happy that you know I have you here so you you can share this type of information. I think that that totally makes sense. And you can't always tell physique wise how how efficient someone is with their, their fascial tensioning or their fascial stacking or zone three versus zone four and things like that. Um, so yeah, it's, it's kind of like a hidden, a hidden power. <laughs> it's a, a hidden sense. strength, because, right? It's yeah, a hidden type of strength. Yeah, almost like your um like your willpower or your your drive and you know kind of determination for something is also kind of like a hidden a hidden power in a sense but yeah for sure any athlete that's able to harness the subtleties of fascial tensioning it's also like a mind body connection so if you get someone who it's hard for them to connect to their body which is a lot of people that i work with and you're trying to explain or teach them the concept of fascial tension. And if they don't understand or can connect to their interoceptors and deep, you know, uh, subtle vibrations within their body, it's harder to explain something like this to them. 
athletes, particularly body weight athletes, martial artists, gymnasts, dancers, um, I feel that they've from from day one, they've learned that their power has to come from within because they're not carrying any resistance, right? Or their power technically comes from the ground. So you have to understand how to work with the ground, how to work with momentum, with gravity, which is completely different than, you know, brute muscular force. Mm -hmm. It's very, very different. And and uh, what, I, what I believe is uh, the way that we, I know how when we first started doing that section and starting the muscles, we actually threw out the, mm -hmm. the fascia tissue altogether, right? We, we didn't care about the fascia tissue because we want to reveal what the underlying uh, uh, muscle is and, and see how it works. But I think that missed out uh, a lot of uh, uh, critical information on, 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 on fascia. But now, you know, you know like, like what you mentioned, uh, Robert Schneib's team, Mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, my, uh, Tom Myers and yep. people they're coming more with more and more research on the on the fascia um, and and what this is showing is that you know fascia contracts I think there's a study come out that it's not just a passive tissue it actually has contracts but this this really fascinates me because what I was uh, trying to tell people is that you can go from a muscle-driven athlete to a fascia-driven athlete, which means that you need to apply relaxation. You have to first have to go up in your fascia tensioning levels, right? So, so what I mean by that is, for example, if someone who's level one and have no fascial connection whatsoever to their, from the feet to the glutes, from the feet to the uh, uh, abs, it's not very high level. They couldn't relax because they re because they're they're, they're uh, relying on muscle. So if they relax their muscle, they basically have no power. But this is not the case for a fascial-driven athlete because their connection is superior. So they're able to relax their muscle and still generate a lot of force. And this is this this is something that's it's, it's really fascinating because there is. Uh, because of the uh, foot morphing work that we're doing, training the feet, the feet actually morphs over time because of the viscoelasticity, which means viscoelasticity is, is a property of the fascia, which means that it, it, will, it will deform if you apply stress over time. But it does not deform if you just give a sudden, sudden uh, type of stress and it will just go back to normal. So the foot, if you are uh, constantly applying the, the isometric fascia tensioning. So over time, it will, it will deform. This deformation can be a good thing. So this is what we, later on, I'm gonna show you a, a photo of LeBron James foot. And I want, I want you to, you know, uh, to share your opinion on it because, you know, uh, not only him, but also elite level um, superstar athlete, they all show signs of fascia tensioning on their foot. Uh, for example, uh, James Harden, which is, uh, you know, uh, another uh, great uh, basketball athlete. Um, what do you think of, so this I want to uh, jump into the uh, discussion of playing sports uh, with the shoe, you know, from a young age to all the way uh, to adulthood versus someone who plays the uh, play sport barefoot throughout their lives. What do you think it, it will happen to that person? Uh, so I'm obviously a huge favor of barefoot, <laughs> non, non shod sports, because the other side of how I look at foot function is really built around sensory input and feeding the mechanoceptors in the bottom of the feet. And then those mechanoceptors in the skin feed proprioceptors and other mechanoceptors in the fascia that surrounds the muscles. So it's, it's an important trigger to the cascade of how we get into uh, intrinsic muscle strength. Now, when you look at injury rates of shod versus barefoot athletes, you will see higher lower extremity injury rates in shod athletes. Um, you actually see different um, utilization of the foot in certain cases if they're chronically 
uh, shod versus barefoot. The subtle articulation of the joints. Again, I work with a lot of dancers versus, you know, purely shod where you're working with some basketball players. Um, you know, I would see more dancers versus basketball players just because of my practice and partly being um, just in New York and starting in certain categories that favor barefoot. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I appreciate the subtleties and the articulation and the appreciation of the, uh, the sorry, of the foot ground connections with a barefoot athlete. Right. However, in those that are shod, football, rugby, soccer, basketball, hockey, I mean, a majority of sports are shod. Mm -hmm. uh, how can you optimize uh, the balance between what the shoe does to the sensory sensitivity of the foot with, uh, with keeping it, you know, stimulated barefoot? So I uh, incorporate what's called barefoot before shod. So I like to have athletes before they put on their shoes to wake up all the mechanoceptors, to start doing short foot and some of these exercises to really kind of harness in um, their foot ground relationship so that when they get into the shoe, everything is efficiently woken up. Um, having said that though, there's some interesting research that shows that if you just do barefoot, so I, I train barefoot all the time. I do dynamic ballistic. I'd rather be barefoot any situation. If you put me in a not a minimal shoe, so kind of a traditional basketball shoe or, or whatnot, and I do the same ballistic movements, my accuracy of movement and my injury rate would actually be higher, right? Because I'm used to one environment, but the shot athlete has to be shod. So you need to train them, not just in the barefoot environment and say, oh, well, we build barefoot strength and therefore, okay, you'll be fine in your shoe. No, that actually sets them up for it a high injury risk because they're not used to that environment. Think of it like transfer of learning. Yeah. So what the study showed is that the best transfer to sport or the lowest injury rate in shod athletes was to do the same drills, um, uh, agility drills or, or whatnot barefoot, right? Get that foot ground relationship in minimal shoes. So you have a little bit barrier and then their game shoes. So is it the cleat? Is it the basketball shoe? So that they are, um, as accustomed to all of those different environments. And then that actually showed the lowest injury rate. Oh, good. So, um, uh, in our, uh, approach to this is that because fascia tensioning can be applied in the shoe in the beginning, yes, there's going to be a uh, barefoot work, but as long as you are cognizant of your feet and applying fascial tension to your feet and generate the same amount of uh, the same same movement patterns, then we're okay. But we're trying to uh, build up enough neurological control. So whether you have the shoe or without the shoe, your feet is, is pretty much fascial tension and your holistic body neurological connection is integrated. So this way you, you are protected versus uh, someone who does not apply fascial tension and their feet is is not uh, in my term morphed over time so there is there is a there is a difference in that um and i i interview with a lot of the um uh very athletic uh athletes and uh and one of them is his name is uh, uh dardor kiani he was the inventor of dunk shows and he basically told me his uh, story of, of uh, his athletic background. He grew up actually completely on barefoot. I think a lot of these elite athletes, for example, Pacquiao, who's an extreme, uh, extreme high level boxer. When they were young, they were very poor. So they had no chance of wearing the shoe. So they were under that condition to play sports, you know, in all type of complex movement with stimulation neurological stimulation because they're playing on the street there's a lot of like different dirt dust or you know small rocks and whatnot you know garbage or stuff like that that stimulates the the mechanical receptors so they're able to apply the fascial tensioning subconsciously so they're not they might not be okay i'm trying to tense my feet because it actually hurts so you have to apply these fascial tension so over time 
their feet changes due to viscoelasticity. And then they're able to tap into a lot of these intrinsic power through fascia internally. So now these people, because they don't have food, they don't have, they don't have time to go to the gym and then lift weights, but they become phenomenal athletes because they have this incredible fascial connection within them. So th that's what I found out. And, uh, and uh, we're trying to, and what, what this, I think the fascial connection is really, really used for is, uh, for example, for, for, uh, you know, barefoot athlete or, or people who are in the, um, uh, who go to the gym regularly to lift weights. And then some people, they just have these, uh, have these dormant glutes. They couldn't engage their glutes. What, what this does is if, if, if you're actually paying attention to your feet and how much fascial tension you're applying, you can actually change the targeted muscle group because your fascia is 75% uh, I, I mean, your glutes is 75% of the fascia or, or not even more. That's what the textbook says, because there is a large chunk of the glutes that's full of fascia. So imagine if that glutes, the, the fascia content in the glutes is not responsive. It's, 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 it's not in the uh, uh, tension form, the form it's all tangled. You're not able to use your glutes the, the opposite way, you know? Yeah, so, no, I... Um... I appreciate always the fascial approach, especially with glutes, because a lot of people will look at, you know, glute power as just purely this hip extension and how do you just optimize hip extension and you, you know, go lower or go more into the bottom of a squat versus, right, right. you know, so you're doing kind of like a hack squat and things like that um, versus what you're saying is if you can harness the feet, like unlocking the glutes is really fascial tensioning get connected to your foundation which is your feet and then of course you have to get connected to your core and then guess what all three of those are related <laughs> so then you get into your glutes um i find that when i look at glute function a lot of people will think of like oh do you feel your glutes or are your glutes firing my my big approach and you would probably appreciate it as well is the timing and when those glutes actually engage so just strong glutes doesn't mean anything it's when are they contracting how fast how many muscle fibers and for how long like that's really when you're looking at optimal glute function all of those three things build off of the fascial fascial cascade that comes from the feet yes it has to come from i, I totally agree i think uh the the uh i think the mainstream understanding on opening up the hips is still based on okay how low you can go uh, you know, uh, try to, or, or isolation, glutes isolation, but there's study out there already proven, you know, hips thrust, for example, with weights. Yes, it might make your glutes look bigger, but it doesn't improve in performance. But there was a study. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Because so if, you're, if your glutes look big or are, look strong, but they're not functional, who can right. Teach, right? Like you, they have to be functional, especially when you're talking athletics. Like athletics yeah. is just about function. It's not, you're not a bodybuilder and you're looking at the physique. It's right. high level, which is where like the secret, secret power of fashion that you were referencing that no one can see, that's not represented through physique. So it's right. so it's much not. less of what you look like and how you actually perform. The neurological, function. the neurological yes. aspect of it. Yes, a hundred percent. So the, uh, so yeah, so so I agree a hundred percent with you. So in our approach, we don't we don't to to work the glutes. We don't really do any type of glutes isolation exercises, or we're trying to deep squat or anything like that. We build it through fascia tensioning from the feet. So yep. and then and then we can measure it with EMG and then to standing. We're not doing any movement. We're measuring, you know, a, a stat statically. You know, standing. You're focusing on your feet, and then you're you see how long your your uh, your glutes can stay engaged. How much how much fi muscle fiber you can engage. You can you can see all that information. So it's 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 really incredible. So really, how also fascia is a three dimensional matrix. It's not two dimensional. I see a lot of people do this clamshell or the uh, hip thrust. These are really two dimensional. So for example, when you stand, you're not going to do the hip thrust no more. You have to move in the three dimensional. Mm -hmm. You know, so those function, those exercises that you're doing can really translate to actual functioning of the glutes. 
Yeah, no, I love that. Uh, when I teach people, uh, I go around and teach, you know, other trainers in different facilities and around the world about foot to core. And I have them do some very basic movements. And then I ask everyone, um, you know, how much do you feel your glutes? And everyone is like, oh my God. And I was like, we really didn't even do like a true glute isolation or, you know, loaded the glutes in a certain way that you would have to be like, okay, I need to really get my glutes. All I had them focus on was foot core and their breath. And everyone was like, my glutes are killing me. Yeah. Which is exactly what you're saying, which is just another synergistic uh, uh, kind of point between us or maybe a reassurance of, okay, what you're doing and how you approach it, what I'm doing, how I approach it. The end result is the same that we're getting this higher glute activation without doing a true glute kind of hip extension type movement, which is great. Right, right. Um, what what do you think about insoles, uh, for example, to treat uh, a sensomoy or sensomoy fracture or you know different type of foot uh, problem? Because you're a bad profession, you're a podiatrist. So, yep. but what do you think of the insoles? Uh